wish to draw attention to the very great injustice that is done to large bodies of women by their exclusion from the franchise. There is a large body of young wives and mothers who feel, very naturally, that if they are capable of bringing children into the world and of being responsible to the state for those children, it is only right that they should have the privilege and protection of the vote in helping to mould the laws which will govern themselves and their children. Then there is the large body of wage earning women. It is estimated that seven and a half. Marx obtained a fair from girls of his age and naturally expects some proficiency. The only one who stands out at all is Dorothy Jewson, who does all parts of a paper equally well. The rest have their defects. Knight High School for Girls, along with all the other schools of the Girls uh, Day School Trust. Um, was set up with a very express intention of providing an academic um, education to girls which would be the equal of the education provided to boys at the time. The period in which um, Dorothy Jewson was at this school, the, there was an ongoing debate within society as essentially about the role of women and that can be perhaps best described within the idea of separate spheres there was a political ideology which was against votes for women and against um, more involvement in women's society, which argued that women had a particular sphere, and that sphere was the home and the family. And men had a separate sphere, and that sphere was politics and the, the, essentially the outside world and the world of work. The education that was provided at the school was not one which would prepare you for a life at home. The education which we received at this school was one which was rigorously academic. I think what's important is that Dorothy Jewson was being educated in an environment which um, praised and rewarded academic and physical success in a woman without, a, without anything else. It was, just, it was that, you, know, you can be whatever you wish to be. Um, I think she obviously took a great deal from that. Perhaps the most interesting photo is, is this one, which I think will be dating from the end of uh, Dorothy Dewson's career at the high school. And why this photo is particularly interesting is because of, I think it's deliberately political nature in its composition. In 1902, 1903, when Dorothy Dewson left the school, women didn't have the vote. With that in mind, this picture is an extremely prominent statement of where Dorothy Dewson and her friends' political and social thinking lies. She's very much involved in the suffragette movement from the time she is at Cambridge University, she says that when she was at Cambridge she fell in love with two ideals which she sticks with for the rest of her life. One is socialism and the other is women's suffrage. When she comes back to Norwich in 1911 she joins a particular suffrage group called the WSPU and this is the group of suffragettes who are prepared to undertake illegal activities such as arson in order to put across the women's cause. In 1927 she's elected the first time to the Norwich City Council and remains on it for 10 years. In the late 20s when she's on board and the early 30s the government is giving out grants to help the unemployed and under Dorothy Dewson the council is using that money to put the unemployed to good work and that's good work we still see in Norwich today. And the work that they were involved in was rebuilding the infrastructure of Norwich, really. So when you think of the great parks of Norwich, think of Eaton Park, think of Waterloo Park, these were all built by the unemployed in the late 20s, 1930s. So in a sense, this is her memorial, her memento. She was a pacifist both in the First World War and also in the Second World War. So she deliberately gets this idea of making toys. The idea is to form, to provide work for women which has nothing to do with any military aim and identifies this way in which local women can be usefully employed, can earn money, but at the same time can be doing something which is totally non-military, totally anti-war. She and a group of like-minded People in Norwich went around interviewing all the, all the poor, or at least a large sample of the poor and the unemployed in Norwich, 
and getting full details of exactly how they were spending, what money they were getting, with a view to proving that it wasn't adequate. It was probably the first detailed booklet that was sold for reference, I think deliberately cheaply, so that a lot of people would read it. Handouts was about two shillings a week for a widow. Dorothy took the line, this wasn't nearly enough. This pamphlet is written in order to enable the citizens to know something of the actual poor law of the city and what it means for those who come under it. Currently, the Norwich Board of Guardians gives two shillings a week and expects these poor widowed mothers to perform the impossible miracle of maintaining a child on that starvation allowance. So the election of female MPs is something that's very unusual. 1923, there was just a total of eight women in Parliament out of probably 650 people. So it was a very great achievement as a woman to become elected as an MP. And of course she is fortunate in a sense, but she is a member of the Labour Party. And when she is elected, the Labour Party is just forming its first government. So she is in a position of some influence. The time has come when the House ought to consider not merely talking about this question of equal franchise, but acting on it. We believe that the 1918 Act was a compromise. It was only accepted very reluctantly by women's organisations in the country because it was...